James Connolly was the great Irish socialist, the great Irish Republican. He lived here in Troy, a few blocks away, uh, from 1903 to 1905. And while he was here, I think he worked for the uh, Metropolitan Life Insurance Company. You know, he had six children, and he struggled desperately to get them over to the United States. And on, on the eve of his children getting on the boat with his wife, his oldest was killed. And Connolly's life was like that. It was uh, one bitter struggle after the, the next. But while he was here, he participated in some very significant international debates uh, in person in Albany and Troy and Schenectady and also uh, by writing and uh, publishing around the world. So Connolly was really a remarkable person um, and that's why this forum's name is his honor. Uh, I'm going to start with announcements. Uh, so if you if you have announcements that I don't that I don't have, feel free to interrupt when I when I get through. Uh, tomorrow night at the Del Mar Reformed Church, there'll be a potluck dinner and a silent auction fundraiser for the benefit and defense of Private First Class Bradley Manning, who's been thrown in the brig and really held uh, as a political prisoner. Um, if you can't go tomorrow night, it's possible to donate anyway to Bradley Manning's defense. And you could see, who, who could uh, you see about that? Uh, Leslie Hudson in the back, or Trudy Quaife, if you can't go and you'd like to help. On Sunday, September 25th, there will be a forum sponsored uh, by the Capital District Alliance for Universal Healthcare and other organizations. It's the future of our healthcare, Medicare for all, versus a private insurance-based system. The speaker is David Ansel. He's the chief medical officer of Cook County Hospital in Chicago, and he's just published a book called Life, Death, and Politics at Chicago's Public Hospital. And uh, he's touring around talking about the hideous inequities in, in the United States in healthcare. On October 6th, and we should, Margaret will talk about this, and we should ask her about it, there will be very big doings in Washington, D.C. Uh, to stop the machine and to create a new world. On the 15th of October, the 10th anniversary of the invasion of Afghanistan here in Albany at Townsend Park at noon, noon to two, um, there'll be a protest. Uh, Townsend Park is where Central and Washington come together. It's a little triangle, and if you ever look at the statue, it's a doughboy with a, with a hat. It's a, it's a monument to the conquest of Guam, Puerto Rico, the Philippines, and Hawaii. It's, it's, I think it's more affectionately known as Imperialist Park. <laughs> so it's appropriate that that would be the place to protest the invasion of Afghanistan. The next um, James Connolly Forum will feature the labor journalist Steve Early. He's, it'll be 7 p.m., not 7.30. It's on October 26th, Wednesday, October 26th. And, um, he, you know, his, his recent book is called Embedded with Organized Labor, uh, Journalistic Reflection. It's on the class war at home. Uh, Early has also recently published a couple of really insightful uh, articles relating the Verizon strike to the Obama health care reform and to the struggle for Medicare for all. So those are upcoming events. Does anyone have uh, something you'd like to add? You're kind of pinned behind The Solidarity Film uh, Series on September 24th at Channing Hall of the First Universe, Unitarian Church, Universalist Church. Uh, Locked Out is 7.30, Saturday, September 24th, and that's um, about a lockout in Boron, California, a small mining town in the Mojave Desert, the Rio Tinto uh, lockout. Um, anything else? Okay, welcome then. I'm going to introduce Dr. Margaret Flowers, who I'm very proud to know as a, as a friend, and uh, I have great admiration for Dr. Flowers. She has set an example of self-sacrifice that is extremely rare in the United States uh, in this time that we're in. She has campaigned tirelessly for social justice. Um, healthcare justice has been uh, on many of the banners that she's carried. <laughs> not, not all, though, thank goodness. And. Uh, <clears throat> She's a Congressional Fellow of the Physicians for a National Health Program and a core organizer of the October2011.org. And we're so honored to have Dr. Flowers come tonight. So please join me as we will.
Good evening. It's, it's really an honor to be here tonight and to be among friends. I appreciate the invitation and the admiration is mutual, really, for many of you in this room. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about um, what I call and many call health injustice. Because here in the United States, we're kind of isolated from the rest of the world, and we don't realize that things that we kind of accept as normal in this country when it comes to health care are completely abnormal. They don't happen in other industrialized nations. And so I think it's important that we start being aware of this, this regular health injustice. Um, I'm going to start out with the Declaration of Human Rights, because the Universal Declaration of Human Rights states in Article 25 that people have the right to health care. And many of the other industrialized nations have created health systems based upon the principles of human rights. And those principles are universality, equity, accountability, transparency, and participation. That the people who are part of that system participate and have a voice in that system. Um, of course, that doesn't happen here. The amazing thing is, is that the countries that organize around those principles have health systems that are much less expensive than ours and have better health outcomes than ours. Just wanted to run through a couple of pertinent uh, times in history because what has the situation that we're in right now in this country, as many of you are, are aware, was really more of an accident of history than, an, than a way of creating a health system. Um, and one of the important points was during uh, World War II when wages were frozen and so employers started offering health benefits in, in order to attract employees. In Europe, we saw a completely different direction. Instead of tying health insurance to employment, as we did here, they, because of the destruction of World War II, were rebuilding and creating anti-poverty programs that included health care. I think the 1980s is another really fundamental shift in this country when it comes to health care, because that's when um, our tax dollars were used to bring private investors into the Department of Health and Human Services and train them on how to take over health care as a fertile profit-making venture. And we started seeing a real shift in language where health became more of a commodity and we saw patients being called consumers rather than patients. And this language, I try to be really careful about my language in health care because I don't ever want to call patients consumers. We're not consuming health care. It's something that people require. And when we use a business language, we feed into that mindset that, that health is a commodity and it really isn't. So here's an example of health injustice. I have people that email me not infrequently to tell me their stories. And this was a, a, a woman who, who wrote me about her husband, not his real name, works in the development op office for a very large hospital in a very large city. And one of the things that he did fundraising for was to bring the state-of-the-art radiation machine to that hospital. But he was diagnosed with throat cancer. You know, they, and the hospital had been promoting how great they were to have this new machine. He developed a throat cancer, and his doctor prescribed treatment from this very machine. His insurance was through this very hospital, and they would not, his insurance would not cover his treatments for his cancer of this radiation machine. Mind-boggling, really, to me. But this is what's happening in our country. And just as a note, there are about 2 million people a year in the United States that are diagnosed with cancer and don't get the treatment they should get because of, of financial reasons. Um, here's a slide just looking at the number of Americans without insurance in this country. And um, as you were, some of you may be aware, the census data just came out yesterday. They've changed the, the way that they count on insurance. I'm, I don't know all of the specifics of that. So they're now saying that the number is 49.9 million, but that is actually a million more over the last year of people that have lost their health insurance. And we're seeing a huge jump in people in the age bracket of 35 to 64. As we see a decline in the number of employers that are offering insurance, we've seen a steady decline for over for now 11 years in those numbers. Um, we're seeing more and more people in that working age uh, group that can't afford health insurance. This is what really gets me, and one of the reasons that I do this work is that um, it's not like in the United States we couldn't have universal, high-quality, comprehensive health care. We can. We're already paying for it. We're spending twice what other industrialized nations spend on their health system per person per year. And this graph basically shows the red bars show how much money is spent per person per year on uh, health care in public dollars, publicly collected dollars. 
And these are old numbers, but the ratios are always the same. It's very little difference. So if we see the United States at the top is already spending more per person per year than Canada, France, Germany, Sweden, the UK, and Japan on health care. And if you add in the whole piece, which is the pinkish bar, that's the private cost, it's twice what these other countries are spending. So we, we have the resources. We could be doing this. Why aren't we doing that? Um, we'll get into that a little bit more. Um, we spend the most, but our health outcomes are not very good. And um, I could go through a lot of different statistics that show you how our infant mortality and maternal mortality rates are high, um, number of people with unmet medical needs and those types of things, but I think this kind of sums it up. Um, because in the U.S. we're so often talking about wanting to be the best, right? You know, we're the greatest at this. This is a study that was done that looked at 19 industrialized nations that they could compare. And they said if each of these nations was functioning as well as one of the top three nations, and the top three are France, Japan, and Australia, how many lives would be saved? How many preventable deaths would you know, not occur? And the United States was 19 out of 19, with an estimated 101,000 preventable deaths, um, and because we don't function as well as one of the top three. Um, so why are we spending all this money, and we're leaving so many people out, and we're you know, not getting very good health outcomes. I think this is one graph that is very indicative of why. If we look at over time at the growth in the number of physicians and then compare that to the growth in the number of administrators, health administrators. And this is a 3,000 percentile mark up here. And you can see it kind of started to take off in the 80s and then really in the 90s. We're spending a third of our health care dollars on things that have absolutely nothing to do with health. With, that are actually obstacles to health. It's all of this paperwork. It's because we have hundreds of insurance companies, and they all have different rules, and they all have different forms, and so they have to have administrators, and we have to have administrators to deal with all their administrators. And, and in addition to that, the insurance companies really see insurance plans as a product. So they have people that develop those products and market them, and then figure out who can get which one, and then once you get that, where do you go? And then you go, what do you need? And then how much do you pay? How much do they pay? So, it's a ridiculously complex and expensive system. We really micromanage our health care. If you think in the hospitals where we have to mark down every like Band-Aid and every IV, and that's a ridiculously expensive way to pay for health. Um, and then another reason that we're um, facing difficulties in this country with our, our health outcomes is, is actually a disturbing trend in the number of people that are considered to be underinsured. This is not just a problem of the uninsured. But now more and more of our uninsured patients are having trouble affording care. There's the product that was designed called a Consumer Directed um, Health Plan or High Deductible Health Plan, and some of them have a health savings account. So basically you pay your premium, but then you have high co-pays and high deductibles that you have to meet before your benefits kick in. And then in some cases you have to pay co-insurance as well on top of that. We see that, that there's a rising trend, I just took two years out, but it is continuing to rise, of uh, underemployment sponsored plans we saw rise from little, like 16% to a little over 20% in those two years. But what's more concerning is these individual plans for that, that pa patients buy outside of employment. Almost half of those now are these underinsurance plans. And um, with the plan that was put forth in the Obama administration, it's likely to force more people into this individual market purchasing through the exchange, and many of them will be buying the lower tier plans, which are these underinsurance plans. Uh, here's another example of health injustice, and uh, kind of an example of why these underinsurance plans are a problem. This is a couple. They had a, raised a large family, worked very hard, working class, never went uninsured at any time in their lives. The father developed a serious condition in December. They met their deductible in that one month in December, but he had the audacity to continue to be sick in January when their new, new year started and their deduct deductible started over. So he again hit their deductible very quickly, and they lost everything, everything, their house, everything. And that's the reality in the United States, is that of all the personal bankruptcies, about 62% of them are due to medical costs, and about 78% of those people who went bankrupt had health insurance plans. In fact, many of them had health insurance plans through their entire illness, um, but they went bankrupt anyway. 
All right, so um, my real awakening was during the health reform process, 2009-2010, when I naively thought that we were just going to go in and, and present data and, and, you know, we would be listened to, right? We had a president who knew what single payer was. We had a Democratic House and Senate. Um, but what we ran up against instead was that we were very much excluded from the process. Um, part of the reason for that is the industries. And so we saw during the reform process that insurance companies give campaign donations to both Republicans and Democrats. In 2008, they gave twice as much to Democrats because they predicted that the Dems were going to take control. And they gave more to people who sat on the relevant committees than not. In 2010, they gave more money to Republicans than Democrats because they saw the writing on the wall again. We also saw during the health reform process insurance company ads that favored the legislation. They were trying to put on this image of, oh, we finally get it. <laughs> There's a problem. We're going to help out with fixing it. But uh, they funneled money on the other side through the Chamber of Commerce to have ads against the health reform. We saw the pharmaceutical lobbyist, Pharma, spending $100 million on ads supporting the reform. And I think that doesn't take much leap to think that if pharma is supporting the reform, it's probably not good for us. <laughs> and then lastly, industry had their hand directly involved in the writing of this legislation. So Liz Fowler left her position as senior vice president of public policy or vice president of public policy for WellPoint, one of the largest insurers in the country, and went to work in the Senate Finance Committee for Max Bock has helped write the white paper that really was the driver for the whole health reform bill. And then, amazingly, after the reform passed in March, she was appointed by the President to the Department of Health and Human Services to oversee the regulations that were put in place for the legislation that was passed. Um, this is an actual cover of The Lancet, which is a British journal, medical journal in December of 2009 as the bill was kind of winding down. The health care reform process exposes how corporate influence renders the U.S. government incapable of making policy on the basis of evidence and the public interest. Is that mind-boggling? <laughs> not anymore. No, not anymore. So what did we get? The bill that passed in Congress is largely based on what's called the mandate model. It has a certain number of, of key components. One is that they expand coverage through the expansion of Medicaid. Another is that they um, require that all who do not have a public insurance purchase private insurance. And then they, we use our public dollars to give to the private insurance companies to subsidize the purchase of the insurance. And in exchange for this mandate that more people would buy private insurance, the insurance company said that they would agree to some regulation. Well, um, the result is we're just pouring kind of more money into an already broken situation, and it's, we aren't addressing any of the fundamental problems. So we often say health reform, we're still for it, because, as I said, we haven't addressed the underlying problems. At its best, once, once the Affordable Care Act, as it's called, um, is fully implemented in 2019, they expect that it will only cover half of the uninsured. So we're going to see tens of millions of people still without insurance. It increases our total health spending by adding more levels of administration. We have these health insurance exchanges. We have to regulate the insurance companies now. We have to enforce these mandates. It's likely to continue this upward trend of the underinsured as more people are going into these health insurance exchanges. And there's no cap on the premiums. People are going to be migrating into the lower benefit plans because that's all they can afford, especially in this economic downturn. I mean, the numbers right now are staggering out right. there. You know, a third of people in the middle income range have fallen into the lower income range. 64% mm -hmm. of people in this country do not have cash on hand to withstand, withstand a $1,000 emergency. Mm -hmm. Our job growth was zero. That means a real loss of jobs. This is, uh, this is really unsustainable. Um, we're mandating that people purchase insurance, but we're not guaranteeing that they're going to get the health care they need. Um, and it restricts patient choice. We heard so much about choice during the reform process. People wanted a choice of insurance. People want a choice of where they go for care. They want a choice of what care they get. Um, and private insurance restricts both of those choices. So we now have decades of experience in the United States with a market-based model of health care, and the data are very clear that it's very expensive. 
that the outcomes are poor. We have increasing health disparities in this country. High number of preventable deaths. We're losing our primary care physicians. And we have a growing number of uninsured and underinsured. So here's another example of what happens in this country. Health injustice. There is um, a medical center in Braddock, Pennsylvania, a very poor community. It was part of the University of Pennsylvania Medical Center, which I've learned is an international medical corporation. They have centers all around the world. The CEO of that corporation earns $4.5 million. They decided that the Braddock Hospital wasn't making enough money, so they decided to close it down, despite the fact that there was a huge mobilization in that community to try to save it, a lot of media attention. There was, it was a predominantly low-income town. Next door was a more affluent town. They decided to open a medical center there instead. That hospital in Braddock had the only restaurant in town, the only ATM in town. And in a single-payer system, this wouldn't happen because every hospital would be given the money that it needs to operate. This is really a crime. So uh, this cartoon shows the United States health system as an airplane with all these patches and balloons and things on it. And it says, we tried every fix the insurance companies allow, but it still won't fly. <laughs> ah, what's going on? So what do we need to get this plane off the ground? In this country, there's two smallest steps that we can take to turn ourselves around, to go from a system that's market-based and in unequal and becoming too expensive to a system that's focused on health, that's guaranteeing that we can improve the health of the population. We need a system. We don't actually have a system based on health. We have a system <coughs> based on profit. It works very well for the corporations. And we need the money to pay for it. And the money to pay for it comes from a single-payer system because we, we are already spending enough, but we're just wasting so much of it. We have an actual system, we put that all into one fund, and we use our health planning based on our resources and our needs, simplify our administration, bingo, we've got it. So this is based on the principles on the, you'll see at the Physicians National Health Program website has something called the Physicians Working Group Proposal, and it's very easy to read, um, it's not very long. You probably are all familiar with this, um, but I'm just going to run through what are the principles of single payer. Unified, everybody in, nobody out. Everybody contributes based on their ability to pay. It's a progressive way of financing. Right now we're very regressive. We're 54th in the world for fairness in financing. All medically necessary care is covered. It's comprehensive. Simplified administration not only saves money, but oh, wouldn't we love to practice <laughs> or be patients in a simple system where we knew what the rules were. Um, choice of physician and treatment, more focus on preventative and timely care. Why timely care? Under a single payer system, we would remove the dedu deductibles and co pays. We know right now that because of those, many patients are avoiding or delaying necessary care. We make an economic decision. Even across the socioeconomic status, people make an economic decision before they go get care, and they don't have the knowledge to know what's necessary and what's not. Um, transparent accountability to the Transparency and accountability are important. So where are we headed right now? I need a drink. <laughs> Let's see. Um, after the reform passed, there was a lot of energy in the single payer movement going towards sing, uh, state efforts. We saw more than 20 states um, getting on trying to do single payer in some phase. Um, really interesting what we saw out of that. California was able to pass single payer twice in 2006 and 2008 under a Republican governor. Suddenly in 2010, we're not seeing quite the same courage of our Democrat, of our state legislators in California um, to pass it. So um, and that's an interesting dynamic there. In Vermont, they mounted a healthcare human right campaign. Very well done, very organized. They did pass a list, some legislation. It is not single payer. What they're finding is that there are a lot of barriers at the state level because you need waivers in order to create a single payer system at the state level. So those are some important lessons. Um, what else are we seeing? We're seeing increasing privatization of our health care. Um, as employer-sponsored plans are falling in number and fewer people can afford private insurance, the private insurance companies are doing just fine. They're just now going into Medicaid and Medicare for their profits. Um, we're seeing uh, in Congress, this is an old slide because 
It's not just Paul Ryan who's attacking <laughs> Medicare and Medicaid at this point. It's across the board. Um, this is P Congressman Ryan who wrote The Path to Prosperity. I like to joke that there's a little writing underneath prosperity, and I'm not sure who it's prosperity for under there, but he basically um, wrote up a plan that would voucherize Medicare, which would pretty much destroy it, and he would put Medicaid into block grants, which means states would only have a set amount of money that they could spend. Instead of it being based on need, they would have to ration based on how much money they have. Um, but we see, you know, and just President Obama's pretty late <coughs> now about saying that he's happy, you know, he's fine with cutting Medicare. Um, Medicaid, um, the White House issued this um, statement, this fact sheet in February. The president came out, um, everybody was very excited as the Vermont bill was heading into the legislature and they were going to need waivers. Um, the White House, the president announced that he was in favor of waivers, but if you looked at the entire fact, fact sheet, he was also in favor of waivers that would allow states to put Medicaid into the health insurance exchanges, basically putting Medicaid patients into private insurance. Not desirable. Um, so where are we? We're in a pretty serious situation. Um, you may recognize this state up here. This is in Albany. <laughs> and then down below it is Madison. So we're seeing at the state level austerity budgets being imposed, um, people fighting back. We're seeing at the national level austerity budget going into effect in October. Um, so how do we reach real health reform? Well, there's three things that we are really key. And I thank Andy, and actually Rose Roach, who realized that it was ICU as I was talking about these principles. Um, we're in a crisis, we need the ICU. We need to be independent. We cannot, as a movement, ally ourselves with a political party and expect to get anything. <laughs> All right, I want to explain that one. <laughs> but independence, we need three things. There's that, we can talk about the three eyes. It's independent movements, independent media, so we can get the truth out there, and then independent politics. Um, we need clarity. We need to be educated and know exactly what it is that will be effective and what is not effective, because we have evidence-based solutions out there pretty much for every crisis that we face. But we've got to be clear so we don't get sold a bill of goods like the ACA. Um, we need to be uncompromising. <coughs> it's a very serious situation here. People are suffering. So we cannot just accept small changes, the changes that we're allowed to accept. We have to demand more. Um, so this is where I usually stop my talk and I say, what, what do we want in this country, a health system we can be proud of? But I'm going to go on a little bit longer. Um, because health care is more, health is more than access to health care. Health care is, access to health care is about 10% of our health. The other 90% is a lot of what are called social determinants. It's do we have adequate education? Do we have a job with a living wage? Do we live in, a, in an area that's free of violence? Is our environment clean? Do we have clean water? Do we have access to food that we can afford that's healthy? Are we treated with respect and dignity? So really, I see and many see health as part of the broader social and economic and environmental justice. And. Uh, we're at a point now where we're not going to elect or email our ways ourselves out of this, this situation. Um, these are photos from Egypt and from Spain, where you're probably familiar, there's been some interesting movements going on there recently. Um, right now, the political process is broken. The corporations are in charge of the political process, they're in charge of the main media message. Um, they have the dollars, but we have something that they don't have. We have the people, we have the numbers. There's 400 people in this country have the wealth of the bottom 154 million. Why are the 154 million not rising up and saying this is wrong? I don't know. So that's what the October 2011 movement is really all about. Um, people kept asking me, well, what's it going to take to get single-payer health care? And I kept saying, well, we need to shift the power away from the corporations. Well, if we look at every issue, the peace movement, all of the economic, social, environmental justice movements, we're all facing the same obstacle. We all advocate for our issue, legislation gets into Congress, it gets watered down to the point of being ineffective. But if we joined ourselves together, now we're talking about power and strength. So we started talking to people in other movements and said, what do you think of this idea? And what was amazing is that everybody was already thinking the same thing. 
they all said, yeah, we're, we were thinking that too. And so we created the October 2011 movement. People signed on quickly. Organizations started signing on quickly. The momentum has been really building. Um, and we put out the call for all who um, seek peace, economic justice, human, human rights, and a healthy environment to join us. We're starting out in uh, Freedom Plaza in Washington, D.C. on October 6th. We're going down there. We already have several thousand who have pledged to join us and others who have not taken the pledge but are joining us. Um, some people don't want their names on a website in this country. Um, the land of the free. Um, so we're going down to Freedom Plaza and we're calling this action Stop the Machine. The machine is corporatism and militarism. And how are we going to stop it? It's going to take resistance. It's going to take strategic resistance. Part of this happened because a number of us were standing out in front of the White House getting arrested in a negotiated protest with the police where we went down and they processed us and we left and everything was done. And we said, we don't want to do this anymore. What if we didn't accomplish anything. We want strategic action. So that's what this is about, shutting things down. And the other piece is create a new world. So we've identified 15 core issues, crises that we face in this country, housing, health care, food and water, transportation, the environment. And we know there are evidence-based solutions, so we're forming committees around each issue, much like the Spanish did. And they used a National Assembly process to bring proposals to the people and say, what do you think of these solutions? And they came up with a very specific list of solutions they want to pursue, and that's what we hope to have as well by the end. We realize that this is actually even bigger than us, the U.S. And um, they, re they realize it too. This is a... Um, a banner in Egypt. It says, rise up, Tunisia, check, Egypt, check, USA. <laughs> and, um, and this isn't some Egyptian protesters. Mr. Obama, time to talk, and USA to the Mubarak <coughs> regime. So um, we issued a global letter saying that we understand that our revolution is your revolution, that we stand in the way of your self-determination and, and economic stability. And so um, what's very exciting is that there are the other movements around the world are joining with us. Um, this week we issued a solidarity statement with the Egyptian protesters. It was signed by um, top people in the Egyptian pro-revolutionary movement. Um, we identified four areas of commonality. We both want a real democracy. We both want an end to for U.S. foreign intervention, you know, interventionalist policies. We want the U.S. to be a collaborative body. Um, we learned that 80% of the USA to Egypt actually goes to American corporations. Um, we both want human needs to be met. We want health care, education, and jobs. And we both want human rights abuses to stop. We want them to be documented and the people who are abusing to be held accountable for their actions. So those are the four areas. Um, the Spanish protesters are also working in solidarity with us and actually have created a movement throughout Europe. They're currently marching to Brussels. Um, on Saturday, we'll be standing in New York with the Occupy Wall Street people, and the European protesters will be standing in Paris having a solidarity action that same day. And then um, they're marching on to Brussels. They arrive, we start in Freedom Plaza on October 6th. On October 8th, they arrive in Brussels and they're holding a solidarity action with us. And then October 15th is a world day of revolution. There are actions being planned all around the globe. So this is really exciting. This is, um, it's just amazing how there seems to be this consciousness that, that we have to do something. And it's happening. So I hope that you'll be part of it. I know that many of you who are in this room have already committed to being part of it. Um, and some of you, uh, Chuck, where's Chuck? There's Chuck. Chuck has already stepped up to be a, a state coordinator in New York. And um, we put out the call as we were getting inundated with questions and people who were interested, and it was a little over overwhelming for us because we're just doing this all volunteer. Um, we put out an email blast and said, who would like to be a local state contact and help organize in your area? Within two weeks, we had 27 states covered with over 30 state contacts. And now we have, I think, 32 states covered with over 40 state contacts. So that's really exciting. Um, so <coughs> you those cards, you're welcome to pass them out. We're asking people to pledge to join us in the plaza. We're staying. We don't know how long we're going to stay, as long as we can, as long as it takes. But this is the beginning of a movement, the beginning of an independent, broad-based social and economic justice movement. And we're going to use both resistance and non-cooperation and evidence-based solutions um, to get where we need to go. 
I'm just quickly going to wrap up with, um, you know, when the British Empire was in India, and, and Gandhi was in front of the British, based from what I hear, and they said, um, they said, do you think that we're just going to leave? And he said, yes, I do. And they said, how do you think that's going to happen? And he said, when you have hundreds of millions of Indians not cooperating with you, I think you'll have the wisdom, see the wisdom to leave. And that's what we can do. Each one of us can non-cooperate with this current system in some way. And we can change it. So I, I'm happy to take questions. I just want to get a sense of how many people want to say something because that'll. Good, okay. That, that's perfect. Thank you. Please, sorry. No, just a quick question. Um, is there anything that those of us who currently have health care insurance coverage can do vis a vis our providers or the HMOs that we already yeah, work with to advance this kind of. Yeah, I think um, it's a tough thing to do, but if you have insurance or you know somebody who has insurance and they're being denied necessary care, to do what you can to fight back and get the insurance companies to cover it or expose the fact that they're not covering it so that more people can see the health injustice that's happening. How about working? I mean, I've spoken with a number of physicians I know personally, and they have spoken about the need for a Medicare for All mm -hmm. kind of program. Mm -hmm. They may not be affiliated with, with your particular organization, but. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking that way as well, sorry, trying to generate, you know, some of the providers' support. Yeah. Okay. You know, that's an interesting, I'm a physician as well. It's an interesting question, historically, in the 1950s, when national health insurance was very much on the agenda, the AMA actually put out a little poster for the office that said, shh, don't talk politics with your doctor. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, Loose lips, lips, same lips. <laughs> and, it's, and there's one of the PHP activists in Florida uh, and this has been done in other places, but he put out <clears throat> flyers for everyone that registered here, take this and learn about what the benefits of Medicare for All would be. I really want to talk to you. In other words, the absolute opposite of that old AMA campaign. I want to talk to you about Medicare for All. And it was tremendously successful, and it made him more popular among his patients. And so I think, you know, I think that that kind of a tactic is something we should play with. It comes up very, very often. And, uh, is there a flyer that we could download that we could have? Could, could I'm sure that I'm people? sure that uh, I think the single parent New York outreach folks would be very interested to try a pilot project of take, developing a flyer, taking it around, seeing how it flies. Yeah. Well, say that again. Who? The single parent New York grassroots organization I think would be very happy to do that here. And one of the doctors that we work with, Dr. Carol Paris. Um, Num a number of us um, went before the Senate Finance Committee in May of 2009 when they shut single payer out and stood up and asked why they were shutting it out. Dr. Paris was one of those doctors. We were arrested for doing that. Lives in a very conservative area of Maryland, Southern Maryland, where she has her practice. And her patients were coming in after they heard about that and giving her hugs and <laughs> saying, thank you for standing up for us. And she has on the bottom of each of her billing sheets, um, I. They, you know, I support National Improved Medicare for All, ask me why. And, you know, so talk to the providers. Okay, next. Yeah, I'm going to ask a question on behalf of my coworkers who are blue collar unionized coworkers. And the question that they raise, um, it's clear about why it's a good thing at the negotiating table, but as people are fearful for jobs and hospitals are one of the biggest employers around, the question comes up over and over, but what about jobs? How will this affect job, jobs for working people? And um, my first inclination was to just scoff, but it comes up more and more, and the people who raise it are people with a union consciousness who are really thinking about jobs. Right. So how does that question get addressed? It's really necessary. I mean, our wages have been stagnant now for decades in this country, and a big part of that is the I hope my of question is clear. I don't mean to interrupt. Yeah. Their concern is specifically about switching the health care system right. from a private And what the jobs would be. Right. right. Well, the, the legislation that we support has, has dedicated transition money for that retraining and salary support for two years. Um, for people that have to transition. Um, and 
the effect would be either net, you know, no change in, in employment or could actually be a boost in employment as people now have more discretionary funds and can start to actually purchase things, which allows employers to start hiring more people. But basically, it's, it's just going to be a shift in what jobs people are doing. Uh, we have a shortage of healthcare de direct patient providers. A lot of, of, of health professionals have gone into administrative positions. This, the situation that we have in this country is driving people out of direct patient practice because it's so frustrating sometimes. Um, those people can come back in to practicing direct patient care <coughs> or people can be trained. We're going to need a lot of people to do public health education, to do you know home care and all of these other things that, that we need. So it's really more of a shift in what the jobs would be. In my viewpoint, I think people would be a lot more fulfilled if they were doing a job of service rather than the job they do now, which is obstructing care through all of this paperwork. So I'll let you call. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not very brave. Uh, I just wanted to thank you for a very informative uh, and inspirational talk. I think uh, you might be right. Uh, I think it may be impossible to elect or email our way out of this. but. Um, if there's a crazy county legislator from a couple hours south who's been elected a bunch of times, who's actually running for Congress on a single-payer platform, it might not necessarily be a bad idea to support that person, right? Well, you know, we have a lot of people that were elected <laughs> on single-payer platforms. And when we had a health reform process going through Congress, we're not willing to talk about single-payer. I would be different. <laughs> you say that now, <laughs> then I'd like to believe you. Look at my political career over the last eight years. Honestly. Okay. I, even Dennis Kucinich was able to be um, pushed into voting for a legislation that he said he would not vote for because the president took him personally on a jet plane to Ohio and put him in front of a crowd of thousands of people the president went out there and whipped all of them up and said, we're going to pass health care reform. Do you want health reform? And then he stuck Dennis out there and he said, so Dennis, what are you gonna, how are you going to vote on health reform? Mm -hmm. And then he told him on the way back that if he didn't vote for it he, and the bill went down, he was going to blame it on him. That's the kind of politics that we're talking about. You can take very dedicated people and put them into this system and it's not effective until we change the system. I agree. But I'm not trying to take the wind out of your sails. I think that you need to be out there talking about it. But I think I think we should have no illusions about what situation we're in right now. Oh, I just wanted to um, respond about unions. And um, one projection is that uh, one third of employers will basically stop providing, once 2014 comes, will stop providing health care and send their employees into the exchanges if they exist. Um, and one, uh, and already many, um, many workers, union members all over the country have already, whether it's in public sector workers where their uh, health care benefits and pensions have come under attack, Wisconsin, Ohio. But I wanted to cite one example. Um, it was a member of a union that I, I had spoken about single-payer health care, and, and this individual was very involved with the letter carriers union, and really said, this isn't going to work. Why do it? And that was a week or two before the Postal Service announced they're laying off 240,000 uh, of their uh, employees, and they're probably going to go to Congress to gut health, uh, the health care benefits that they have. So I would just say, to, in talking to union members, is that there are no guarantees that what you have now, you're going to have a year from now, and that's why this is the only solution. We were in D.C. Um, doing an action, and the D.C. police wouldn't arrest any of us. And when we talked to them afterwards, they said that they had their pensions frozen, and I think, if I'm right, their, their wages were held at the same level for seven years in order to maintain their current health benefits. You know, I, I think Alice has touched on something that uh, we don't hear enough about, perhaps. And that is, uh, 
yes, the system is criminal. Yes, you have to have compassion for people who are being hurt. But you have to move beyond that, perhaps, to your own self-interest. And, and the fact that people are losing their jobs, and the fact that health care benefits are going to go out the window, makes it all the more clear that we need Medicare for all. We don't need uh, employer associated Right. Employer associated uh, health insurance is probably not in our long term self interest. That's what we're grappling with here, which is a difficult concept. But the movements in Europe and the Middle East are movements, are middle class movements for their own self interest. Right. Yeah, the stories on our website, we have a section called Why I Will Be There, and people are sharing their stories. And there are the, the American story. Um, there's one gentleman who's an amazing writer who um, had two properties in the Poconos Mountains, had his own business, he loved shining his Mustang, he remodeled his house, he lost everything. And he's a homeless person now. Mm -hmm. And he said that he talks about this whole culture of now being homeless and going out in the community and being able to recognize the other people that were in the same kind of position as right. him that are now homeless. And he talks about kind of the knowing stare and the understanding that they have. This is the American story. I think um, I live in Fulton County, which is very rural, and uh, I'm a single payer supporter. There's a program called Win Win that one of the single payer activists, Tom Knocky, developed. And so I took the win-win program, which is um, calculating the amount of money that uh, a various employer would save if they used the um, projected uh, percentages in the single-payer bill. And I did it for my own uh, rural school district. Um, and I had to do the figures over and over again because I couldn't believe it they would save between 3.9 and 4.4 million dollars every single year if we had Medicare for all. And so if anybody's interested, we could run the figures for your particular um, district or, or a private employer or whoever. When people realize how much money would be saved, money that could be used for worthy things. Right now, we're paying our taxes for health care rather than for education. So if you're interested, um, it's a good place to start. Um, I, first of all, I, one question I have is, would you say that at this point in time, the majority of physicians and other providers are against the current system? Yeah, there is a, um, a pool done in Massachusetts because the Massachusetts 2006 reform is very similar to the national reform, and they found that only 14% of Massachusetts physicians favored that, and the plurality of them favored a single-payer system, or um, then the second, what came in second was a public option. So has it ever been, has the idea ever been raised, and I don't know if this is a possibility, I don't know how it could happen, but imagine if there were organization, there was organization of, of all of the providers, and if providers withdrew from all these insurance panels that they're on, so that these insurance companies wouldn't have enough providers to justify people paying for their health insurance, has that ever been considered? In some ways that's already happening. We're seeing the onset of, of more boutique practices where doctors just don't accept health insurance, mm -hmm. um, particularly in the mental health we see um, because insurance benefits don't cover mental health. Um, that doesn't create the system, unfortunately. It just puts more of the burden onto the patient who then right. can't afford to get that. No, it would have to be massive organizing. There would have yeah. to be massive numbers. I don't mean yeah. to I'm not sure we're at that point yeah. in the physician community, but we do see more and more physicians kind of dropping out of the current system and finding alternative ways to practice. In New Mexico, there was a fantastic clinic where the doctors just decided to create their own um, where they accept very low pay 
Um, they don't turn anybody away. The average bill that patients can have um, is around $30, and they don't bill. And 98% of their patients pay their bills in full. If, even if they don't do it at that visit, they stop back in every week and give them a few more dollars. And you know, you see things like that happen. Yeah, I think that if we're going to win, we need to do a much better job of explaining the finances of it. I mean, I think that we should be telling people that if you you know, pay a 4% payroll tax and your employer pays a 4% payroll tax and, and that would be the way to pay for it. People understand payroll taxes for Social Security and, right. you know, and then they can start getting raises again and they can quit their goddamn job if they hate it and you know, start a new business. And, yeah. you know, we've got the economic argument, we've got the moral argument. We've got the but the public doesn't argument. understand the financing part of it. That's yeah. what they're afraid of. That, that's what needs to be explained much better. The public right. is with us. Yeah, and the public is with us. Yeah. The polls show already we have a super majority on this. I think, was there someone here? Okay. Uh, this is not exactly uh, on the finances you were just talking about, but I was wondering, you said how many more uh, medical people have gone into administration, you know, this whole skewed thing. Right. I mean, is that a matter of, of finances? Is it more lucrative? to be uh, in administration than it is in uh, patient care or however you want to describe it. Is that some, why that's yeah, true? For some primary care doctors, yes, because they get a salary and benefits through that type of a corporate job and regular hours. And yeah. I mean, I think the burnout rates in primary care doctors now are around 10 or 15 years. <laughs> And you said you were losing them. Is that because they're going into specialties or because they're burning out? They're or? dropping out of clinical practice. And then also medical students are not going into primary care. The majority of medical students come into medical school wanting to do primary care. But because of their high student debt and the low reimbursement for primary care doctors, they come out choosing mm -hmm. uh, more specialty care. So we have like 70% specialty and 30% primary mm -hmm. care. We really need to have more of a 50-50. Yeah, so that's part of this whole deal, right? Right. Yeah, but what's exciting is that for the first time in like a decade, in uh, during the, the residency match of 2010, when health reform was, you know, there's a lot of talk about health reform and people thought they were really getting something. That was the first time we saw an uptick in medical students going into primary care. So I think it's like that if we build it, they will come. I think that they want to do that, but there's just so much against them. Curious in terms of the uh, where is the AMA these days in terms of this whole thing? I mean, you know where they were post World War II in the fifties. Gone. I'm well aware of it. Just curious, have they mellowed at all with, with this whole thing? The AMA is a curious organization. They they don't represent most physicians. Only fifteen percent of practicing physicians belong to the AMA. Uh -huh. I've never belonged to the AMA. Most of the people I know have never belonged. Um, they're really a special interest lobbying group. They were really kind of forced by, you know, kind of image to have to kind of support the reform, you know, that the well, president was putting together. It. Did they actually back or just not oppose it? <laughs> did they back it, Andy? Do you remember? I don't, think, I don't think they really backed it, but they didn't oppose it. Post single payer, though. Yeah. Oh, the a single payer is socialized medicine in their eyes, you know. Okay. Just Thanks. like Medicare. Okay, so, um, yeah. Go ahead. Um, I saw this movie recently about Phil Oaks, and he said something like, it was kind of creepy. 30 years ago, he's saying, the left just doesn't know how to connect to working class people in the U.S. And, uh, and uh, it seems so true, and I went, and I guess because I, we live in upstate New York, I was at a, for work at um, county fairs, recently and like I'm sitting here thinking I bet they don't have health insurance they don't right. I mean it's right. just I'm feeling like we're like I'm missing a moment like we should be at these fairs with all these farmers mm -hmm. and, and people that are kind of underemployed doing handyman work mm -hmm. but we need a lot of people to do it but I was just thinking uh, although it's artificial, because now we're showing up at the tea party is there. <laughs> and, you know, they don't have that much credibility, so yeah. we could, uh, I mean, I, what's your thoughts about trying to work with agricultural communities? Absolutely. I mean, that's what, um, I think the October 2011 movement is based on four kind of things that we need to do, and this comes out of Gene Sharp, who um, 
we've been studying a lot about nonviolent resistance and how power has been shifted. And, and the four things that they say you need to do um, is you need to empower the, those who are affected, the, right. the, the poor, the homeless, and you know, those who are the most affected. You need to build a strong internal resistance force, so people that are willing to engage in nonviolent resistance. Um, I always forget the third one. You're going to forget too, aren't you? Oh, institutions. You have to weaken the institutions. There are various uh, pillars that prop up our, our current system, and you have to weaken those, you have to democratize those pillars to weaken them. And then the fourth thing is you have to have a really vision, a grand strategy of where you want to go. So, so that's what we're working on. We have um, the Poor People's Economic Human Rights Campaign is working with us, the National Coalition for Homeless, the American 99ers Union, um, just a whole lot of, of groups. And um, it is going to be about, after this action, going out to the communities and both educa educating about um, what's going on, but also educating about things that we can do. We were part of uh, the Democracy Convention in Madison last month. Um, we organized the Economic Democracy Track. There are lots of things that we could do to democratize our economy in this country that would undermine corporate power, public banks, local currencies, participatory budgeting, co-ops. These are things, practical things that people can do in their communities that can move us in the right direction. And so um, what's exciting is that 30 years ago, there wasn't an organized body to teach people how to do co-ops effectively, and now there is. And, and we have lots of models around the U.S. to look at. So. I have two uh, short questions. One is, uh, uh, does the uh, Physicians for a National Health Plan uh, have a uh, uh, proposal with regard to the cost of medical education and the indebtedness that uh, uh, a young doctor almost always uh, is facing? The other question is, if you could go into a little bit more detail on the Vermont plan and on the uh, on the waiver issue. Sure. So the um, the first question about medical education, um, Physicians for National Health Program works um, collaborates with the American Medical Student Association, and they have de defined a very specific things that they would like to see with regards to making medical education more affordable. So we have not, I think, our focus is to get a system that's, that's a single payer system. And then there's a lot of things that we need to do from there. But those are just like the two smallest steps that, that we can do. Um, in terms of the Vermont legislation, um, you know, a single payer system means everybody's in one system and it's comprehensive. The reason is we don't want to have a lot of different insurance companies. We don't want people to have to purchase supplementals because if you have to have insurance companies, you don't get that administrative savings. You know, the, 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 the beauty of a single payer is it's one system, one set of rules. Under a Medicare, traditional Medicare-like system, about 3% of the dollars are spent on administration as opposed to a third that we spend on private insurance. So um, the Vermont legislation is um, not to provide comprehensive benefits, so people would need to get supplementals. And, it, and it's not everybody in. The, um, the, the waivers that they would need to get is that the federal government would need to grant them waivers to be allowed to include the Medicaid and Medicare populations to roll those in. And they don't have those waivers, so those populations are not in their single payer system. That's about 42% of their population. And then um, large employers who provide their own health benefits there's another federal law, it's called ERISA, mm -hmm. the Employee Retirement Income Security Act, that says that you can't mandate employee benefits. So you could not tell a large company like IBM in Vermont um, you know, that they can't have their own insurance. So those patients are excluded. Um, so um, you know, right now they're just they're trying to create something called Green Mountain Care. Some of the other kind of basics of a single payer system is that you take out the not for I mean take out the for profit institutions because they're more expensive and their health outcomes are worse. They didn't do that. Um, some of the things like global budgeting. I don't think they had global budgeting. Anymore, did they? They, yeah, they didn't. They didn't use the global budgeting for hospitals, which is another important way to make sure that hospitals have the funds that they need and to simplify you know the the cost process. 
Yeah, I'd like to get into a little bit to your whole October movement question. Um, I mean, I fully support the notion that, you know, elections and emails and <laughs> the rest of it aren't going to solve anything and the political system is broken. Um, however, it seems to me in terms of to build the kind of movement that is taking place in the Arab Spring, and Egypt particularly, as a model, um, you need two critical things, st strategic approach, two critical constituencies, young people and workers. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you look at Egypt, I mean, the, pe the people who were out on the street were predominantly young people, not only, but predominantly. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, the buildup to, the, Arab, to the, the Egyptian up upheaval was, you know, strikes and, and wor worker uh, unrest on a, all over the country for a number of years before. Mm -hmm. um, and it seems to me that we're not quite at that stage here in the United States. I'm, I'm curious as to how, how, what kind of response you are getting from young people. I mean, young people were uh, critical to the whole Wisconsin thing, mm -hmm. but on the other hand, the organized labor leaders were able to derail that Wisconsin thing into electoral politics yeah. Um, yeah. and basically drove it into a ditch. Right. Um, and, uh, so where are we? Where are given the, that? Where are you? Where do you think we are here in the United States? And what do you, and what do you expect to come out of, uh, uh, you know, asking people to go to Washington and sleep on the pavement for a yeah. couple of weeks? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. No, I hear you. So um, one thing is, is that there, there is a lot of revolt going on around this country and has been uh, brewing more and more for a while. It's it's many people are not aware of it because it's not covered by the corporate media. But there have been actions all around the country, um, you know, from pregnant teenagers taking over their school and, and occupying it when the city wanted to close it down, um, students in Arizona whose cultural programs were taken away, who took over their, you know, the, the council meetings, chained themselves to the chairs to get their program back, um, the environmental movement, um, you know, we see some in the union movement, of course, occupying the state capitals. Um, we're seeing it in all different areas, but it, it's, it's it's not being covered by the corporate media, but that, that re revolt is already happening. And we may already be at that point where people are ready, if somebody is out there visible and doing it, to join in, because so many people are kind of have this sense. We may not be ready. You know, this is a, it's a shot. You take mm -hmm. your shot, right? You figure right now that's where the world momentum is going. Um, people, the problems are growing. People need an outlet. We had so many people writing us saying, I've been waiting for this. I, I've been waiting for somebody to lead this. So, so there are people out there who are ready, and we don't know if it's going to be a critical mass yet or not. But that's why we call this the beginning. Yeah. Um, because we're not going away. You know, 30 or 40 years ago, Powell wrote the memo, uh, was it Lewis Powell? 40, 40 years ago, that outlined the plan for the right to take over this country and the all the things, the corp, corp well, corporations, the right corporations. Mm -hmm. to take over this country. And they, and they followed that plan and that's where we are today. This is the beginning of our plan to take it back. And if we <coughs> don't succeed this time, right. we move out into the communities, we continue to organize an independent movement, we continue to educate about methods of non-cooperation, we come back and we do it again. So we really don't know, but the, we're just, you know, we figure that we've got to at least try, because you never know until you try. Um, there was a second part to your question. I forgot what it was. Labor? Youth? Oh, the youth. Yeah, actually, we do have um, youth, particularly in the environmental movement, mm -hmm. some really awesome youth. These people get it. And, um, and we are doing, like I said, it's like we put it out there. This just came from a group of individuals who said, we're tired of symbolic actions. Let's see if we can do something. And all these different sectors have been coming in and getting involved. We have a whole university pre professor sector of um, universities. We've, we've even been endorsed by a department of a university. State uh, University of New York. Yeah, SUNY, actually. <laughs> College of Rockport, yeah. Um, 
So um, these professors are incorporating this into their curriculum. Some of them are going to be teaching their classes from Freedom Plaza by Skype. Mm -hmm. Some of them are giving their students credit for coming to Freedom Plaza. Um, we're doing a big teach-in at George Mason University next week. And then the next weekend, we have a hip-hop artist, very well known, who's flying out for no cost is flying out to University of Maryland for their Radical Rush Week to do a, a promotional event. This is a University of Maryland College Park has tens of thousands of students. Um, so we're going to try to get them down to Freedom Plaza. Um, so I think we can, and, and also, yeah, actually, American University and George Washington University have asked us to come and present at their school. So I think, I think we're going to see some use of this. Oh, and we had students that, two students that dropped out of school in Colorado just to take on our social media. They contacted us, and the, the girl's a 4.0 student, has one semester to go until she graduates, and she said, this is more important to me than my last semester. Mm -hmm. And she's taking over our Twitter campaign, and she and her boyfriend are developing a Twitter campaign to try to get as many people aware of what's happening on this <laughs> 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 What's the relationship uh, of your organization to uh, the AFL-CIO? Well, we, um, yeah. we don't, we're not, we're an individual-led movement. There's, there are over 130 organizations so far that have endorsed us. None of them have any control over this movement. It's strictly individuals. We have reached out to labor. Labor's in a real conundrum. I think right now. And, um, <laughs> as an example, you know, I was really excited when the Emergency Labor Network formed, and they, in March, they met in Cleveland and came up with their 15 principles, and it was about building a broad-based, yeah. independent movement that represented all workers, union and non-union. And I was like, yes. They had a follow-up conference at Kent State in June, and they invited me to be their keynote speaker. I think when they invited me, it was before we'd gone public with the October 2011 movement. Um, as it got close to the time, I got this email that said, oh, um, something's come up. We can't have you as the keynote speaker. Um, so we'll give you eight minutes at, at night, Saturday night, you can talk. And then I get this other email, oh, and by the way, we'd really appreciate it if you wouldn't mention that October 6th. <laughs> <laughs> They didn't want, they were afraid that if I got up there and talked about building a broad-based independent movement, that the people there would go with me. And, and the guy in control wanted, he had his own kind of idea of what he wanted to have. Mm -hmm. So we printed up 250 postcards and we started the day that we got there, <laughs> talking to every person that was there about the October 6th movement. And I talked about it in my speech. <coughs> And one of the union presidents, is, what is she, president of the ILC, she's one of our big endorsers. So, so we have some, we've got a, U, a UAW president, IWW, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think, you know, I think union leadership is not representing the rank and file. We, we were joking around at this convention in, in Wisconsin. It was the democracy convention, nine tracks on democratizing various sectors of our society. So media, education, elections, the economy, there's one on racism, on the constitution. And uh, we were joking and saying we need a, we need a, a track on democratizing unions. I think I heard you mention um, one of the things to focus on with the October 20th movement is targeted resistance. Right. Um, was that some specific things you had in mind, or is that something that would be an embryonic or a dynamic process that would develop from the groups and organizations, individuals that come out of that? Both. So we have, um, for our first day, we already have a plan in mind of, uh, we chose a Thursday. It's, it's kind of this great intersection of, of the going into the 11th year of the Afghan war, which is outrageous. The first week of the federal budget, which is unlimited spending for military, military but austerity, austerity for everything else. 
Um, and it's a Thursday, business as usual, going on in the city. So our plan is to shut something down that represents the problem with everything that we have mm -hmm. going on in this country. But in addition to that, we have, um, in the plaza, we have different areas that are designated. We have an arts area. We have um, an area that's going to be like committees. We're going to be working on our 15 committees. And then we have a civil resistance area. And each day we're going to be planning civil resistance. We have a legal team, we have legal observers, we have peacekeepers, and we have um, really great creative people that have done creative resistance. So we actually merged our arts and our, and our resistance committees because they found that they were working so much hand in hand that it made sense to just be one. So we'll be designing and creating props and designing some really cool actions. And um, we want to have both arrest and non-arrest components so that everybody can participate. It's starting on October 6th. October 6th. At what time? You can arrive, start arriving at 9 in the morning for registration. Okay. And our, we're having a rally and concert okay. at noon. Um, we did this in New York as kind of a test in, um, in April um, for tax day. Well, April 15th, we had an action at a Bank of America. And we got 17 different organizations of uh, diverse types of organizations to endorse this action. And we had a, a concert in Union Square Park with um, this great band called Junkyard Empire, these young rock, hip hop, great guys. And Chris Hedges spoke. And the combination of the music and just a few very powerful speakers, we um, had a woman whose home was being foreclosed who got up and told her story. And people were energized. We went over to the bank and started picketing outside, and we had hundreds of people picketing the outside of the building, and we had um, created a little cardboard town of what we wanted our money to go for instead of going to corporate welfare. So it was like schools and, and, and hospitals and green jobs. And about five of us had decided that we were willing to go into the lobby and set up our town. And as soon as we opened the door and started to go in, everybody came in. We took over the lobby. There was somebody with his guitar singing songs. We were giving speeches. The police were laughing. <laughs> and the energy was so high. We, we finally, the bank closed, and we decided, OK, we've done what we wanted to do. And we left, and everybody's like, but we want to get, get arrested. And we're like, well, we didn't plan for that. You know? <laughs> so we're not doing that today. But it was just really great combination. So we're hoping to use the combination of speakers and music and just get people motivated and ready to go do a very creative, symbolic, not symbolic, strategic, but symbolism of what our real problem is in this country, actions. I know that the Mental Health Empowerment, Mahap, is going to um, Washington on the 19th. Is that a Wednesday, I believe? The 19th, they're going at 3 in the morning. They're leaving from core states uh, for Medicare. Oh, I don't know about this. Yeah. Learn more about the nineteenth of October, September. We didn't hear that. That'd be a Monday. Uh, the nineteenth is Monday, but yeah. it's the Wednesday. What is it? Twenty first. The twenty first. Okay. That's twenty first. Three in the morning. Three in the morning from where? From Cross Gates Mall. Okay. And where are they going? And they're going to Washington D.C. Okay. Okay. We have people driving in care, organizing caravans from all across the country. Um, we have people walking from West Virginia, 200 miles, to come to Freedom Plaza. There's a group that's biking right now from New York that's going to end up in Freedom Plaza um, and do our evening. Our evening program on the 6th is going to be focused on the war. So there's a group called A Ride Till the End of Afghan young Afghan vets and other peace um, advocates who are riding their bikes to D.C. They're going to kick that off as well as the, um, we'll be, if all goes well, we'll be doing a live stream um, thing, interactive thing with the Afghan youth peace volunteers mm -hmm. live from Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. so, that's exciting. Yeah. Great. Well, well thank, thank you, Margaret. Thank you. Steve Early, the labor journalist, he'll be coming over from Boston. It's uh, 7 p.m. Wednesday, October 26th. Please spread the word. Where is that? Right here.